today's video I wanted to discuss chapter 3 in the textbook Governing Texas. It is titled Texas in the Federal System. In chapter 3 the objectives include understanding the foundations of the US federal system, tracing the major changes in national and state power over time, and describing the sources of tension between national and state power. In recent years, Texas state leaders have been at the forefront of calling for checks against the national government's power, raising questions about the role the national government plays in immigration policy, voter identification, affirmative action, and environmental legislation. Federalism is a system of government in which power is divided between a central government and a regional government. The United States has a history full of conflict over the balance of power between the federal and the state governments. However, even with all of this conflict, federal power has still grown over time. The Articles of Confederation was the United States' first governing document, giving the states the primary role in governing and leaving the national government weak in its powers. But without the power to tax, enforce legislation, or protect the borders, it was clear that the United States needed a stronger national government. The U.S. Constitution established a federal system in which the national government and each state government is sovereign. This means that um, the government received its power from the American people and the states received their power from the people of the individual state. Powers are delegated to the national government in the U.S. Constitution, including national defense, immigration, and foreign policy. Powers are reserved to the states in the Tenth Amendment or the States' Rights Amendment, which was added in an effort to alleviate concerns that the federal government had too much power. It stipulates that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The relationship between the national and state governments saw numerous challenges in the 19th century. McCullough v. Maryland in 1819 was the first, which upheld the supremacy of the national government in disputes between the states. Later in 1824, Gibbons v. Ogden broadly defined Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce as delegated in Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, making it one of the most important regulatory powers of Congress. Texas joining the United States as a slave state helped fuel tensions between the North and the South. The secession of Texas and other southern states was fought partially because of the relationship between the national and state governments and because of the return of the southern states to the Confederate system. Challenges to the legality of secession came to a head in Texas v. White, where Chief Justice Salmon Chase stated that the Constitution, in all of its provisions, looks to an indestructible union composed of indestructible states. Federalism in the United States has changed over time. Before the Great Depression, the national government was small, with most of the governing done by the states. The New Deal brought the United States into a new era of federalism in which the power of the national government grew through presidential decrees, legislation, and court decisions. A political scientist named Morton Grodson described the changes using a cake analogy. In layer cake federalism, the levels of government are largely separate. The layer representing the national government's power and responsibility is smaller than the one representing the powers of the state governments. And Marble Cape Federalism describes where the boundaries between national and state governments are blurred. Dual Federalism describes the period from 1789 to 1937 in which the responsibilities of the national government and the state governments were clearly separated. Under this system, regulation of the economy and individual behavior was largely left to the states. So in Texas, this meant that the state government could regulate oil production and segregation laws. Cooperative federalism has been in effect since the New Deal era. In cooperative federalism, national and state governments work together to provide services. Often these services are through grants and aid used to encourage but not require states to pursue nationally defined goals. This causes the 10th Amendment to no longer be seen as such a barrier to national power. In 1942, Wickard v. Filburn, the Supreme Court recognized regulatory power of the national government under the Interstate Commerce Clause to be so broad that there seemed to be no boundaries on national power. 
President Johnson added new national programs under his Great Society campaign to fight poverty and oversaw the expansion of the national government to protect the rights of minorities. New federalism can be seen in attempts by President Nixon and Reagan to return power to the states through block grants. These are federal grants that allow states a considerable amount of discretion on how funds are spent. Coercive federalism is the most recent form of federalism in which federal regulations are used to force states to change their policies to meet national goals through unfunded mandates. These unfunded mandates require that state or local governments pay the cost of federal policies and preemptions, which prevents states from acting in areas that the Constitution exclusively reserves to the national government. Texas and other Republican states rejected coercive federalism by filing lawsuits against the national government. Among these were challenges to Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, to immigration laws, and to new gun laws. Texas has been involved in a movement to use the Tenth Amendment to prevent national government from forcing states and localities to comply with federal requirements. The 13th Amendment banned slavery, ending it as the basis of the Southern economy. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment banned states from denying equal treatment to individuals. In Texas, a law student challenged the separate but equal precedent by asserting that the black law school was inferior to the all-white University of Texas law school. The Supreme Court agreed, setting the stage for fully striking down the precedent in 1954 with the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka decision. The 15th Amendment gave Congress the authority to pass the Federal Voting Rights Act to protect their right to vote where it was denied or restricted based on race or color. Texas was subjected to the preclearance provision requiring federal officials to approve any state law related to voting. Texas joined Shelby County, Alabama in its challenge to the preclearance provision, arguing that it violated the 10th Amendment. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Shelby County, Alabama, emphasizing that all states enjoy equal sovereignty and the states have the broad power to regulate elections. Texas's voter identification law was challenged by the national government as discrimi discriminatory towards minority voters. The result was a temporary agreement that does not necessarily restrict the state from additional modifications to the voter identification requirement. States can expand the rights of citizens through independent state grounds, using the state constitution to expand rights beyond the provisions of the U.S. Constitution. For example, in Texas, the state constitution protects the right to an efficient system of free public schools and expands federal equal protection provisions to include sex. Tensions between the parties in power at the state and national level led Texas to sue the Obama administration 46 times over a variety of issues, but most importantly over immigration. Texas was among 26 states that sued to block President Obama's immigration policies that would allow undocumented immigrants to remain in the United States. Texas's Attorney General Ken Paxton argued that immigration reform should come from Congress, not the executive branch. The Supreme Court was tied, leading to a 4-4 to -four decision and leaving the changes in place. A shared party affiliation at the state and national levels has led to a more favorable approach to the Trump administration. Paxton has shown support of President Trump's travel ban and border wall, despite his concern for the property rights elsewhere in the state. However, the state did sue the Trump administration over the Nevada nuclear waste site and has pressured it to end the DACA immigration program initiated by the Obama administration. In this chapter, we discussed how federalism has significantly changed over time, and we have every reason to believe that it will continue to change. Leaders in Texas want to return power to the states, arguing that the national government is too distant, controlling, expensive, and unresponsive. Democrats tend to look to the national government for help, while the Republicans want to figure it out on their own, leading to disagreements over federalism. The intensity of the agreement over federalism varies depending on which political party controls state governments, Congress, and the White House. 
Our objectives earlier included understanding the foundations of the U.S. federal system, tracing the major changes in national and state power over time, and lastly, describing the sources of tension between national and state power. So for understanding the foundations of the U.S. federal system, along with many other countries, the American system of government has divided power between national and state governments. The division of power has varied over time, and America's notion of federalism has evolved through a number of forms. Tracing the major changes in national and state power over time, American federalism has gone through major changes over the history of the country. In the late 19th century, there was a strict division between the powers of the states and the powers of the national government. That division was called dual federalism or layer cake federalism. During Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, federalism was dramatically redefined and there was greater involvement of the national government in all areas of American life. Cooperative federalism or marble cake federalism became the new approach to state and national relationships. In recent times, many believe federalism has taken a new form and has become coercive, with national governments compelling states to act in ways that achieve national priorities. Describe the sources of and tensions between national and state power. The incorporation of much of the Bill of Rights has limited the power of state governments by making them subject to restrictions under the U.S. Constitution. Additionally, the preemption doctrine has allowed the national government to prohibit state legislation in certain fields. An important constitutional provision that limits state action is the 14th Amendment, particularly the Equal Protection Clause of that amendment, which prohibits discriminatory actions by state governments. Until recently, a number of jurisdictions, including Texas, were limited by the 1965 Voting Rights Act in the legislation that they could pass involving the electoral process. Although a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision has made it possible for Texas to pass controversial voter identification legislation. Finally, while state governments cannot reduce the rights guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution, they can expand those guaranteed under the concept of independent state grounds. So that's all for this chapter. I really, really hope you learned something today. I really appreciate you joining me uh, and watching this video. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to join me in the comments below. Um, and remember to like and subscribe. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.